So, does any of you recognize this shape? It's up here now. Are there any dog owners in the audience? <coughs> I can see there's a few eyebrows rising. Well, this detour started a couple of years ago when I was given the task of cleaning up in the backyard. Lucky for me, it was cold and it was actually possible to pick these samples up with woolen mittens. But as I was doing this, I started to see a pattern emerge. There were letters in these samples, and not just letters, a whole alphabet. <laughs> a simple cleaning project had derailed, but Hugo, he agreed that this was a great idea, and he handed over his intellectual property to me. <laughs> the font Shitface was born. And I made this font so you don't have to. <laughs> what I really like about this font is that it has a really unique double meaning. And this makes for some really fun correspondence. So, how come a simple cleaning project ended up being this stupid little font? Well, to me, this is a very specific illustration of my creative process. I've made it my life mission to goof around, to seek those opportunities where I can derail. It's illustrated here, and I think it's really important for these projects to thrive. And at the same time, you need to sort of figure out what's your goal. To me, first of all, it's bread on the table, which my family agrees to as well. But also, it can be a good laugh, surprising friendships, but most of the time, it's new knowledge. To have a good idea, you have to have a lot of ideas. This is a quote by a Nobel uh, Prize winner. Linus Pauling. I agree strongly to that quote, but I've made my own spin on it. Quantity equals quality. The more kids you have, the bigger the chance is that one of them will turn out as a lawyer, <laughs> engineer, or even a doctor. Myself, I've not succeeded with any of those. But my path to doing these side projects started out when I did not graduate from my studies in San Francisco. But I was sending these postcards out when I was heading back to Norway to seek a job. And it's quite sort of cocky for a new, new uh, fresh out of school student to send out these postcards. But if you take yourself too serious, it's because nobody else does. And I believe that to be very true. And I still do. And the thing is, to follow through on this, it's really important to put yourself out there. I like to think that we've all given a spool of thread for life. So you can either choose to stretch it out and save up for later, or you can wiggle, twirl, and mess up along the way. If you do the latter, you'll have so many more stories, and I think a much fuller life experience. But that's, simple, uh, that's simply said, but how do you do that? Well, you have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to put yourself out there. You have to do th stuff you don't know how to do. And if you take yourself too serious, you won't, because you'll be too afraid of failing. I had my chance to test this out as I embarked on a skateboarding story as I was turning 34. Uh, we had just moved to a new place in Oslo and our next door neighbor was a skate park. I'd always wanted to do this, so I padded up, helmet, everything, new skateboard, and went down there. And I thought it was good fun, and I thought it went really well, back and forth. Never done ramp before, so it was sort of, that was the thing I was doing over and over again. So one day when taking a break, 
This maybe 12, 13 year old kid came over and he asked, why do you suck? <laughs> and, and, and I was like, I, I, was, I was really surprised because in my head, this was going really well. But he was right, of course. He was looking at this fully padded guy, full beard, old guy. He was just doing this. <laughs> so he was really disappointed. But what I learned from that lesson was to put my teeth together and just keep doing it. Because I had so much fun learning this, so nobody was going to ruin my party. And um, anyway, Skater Dad was born. And a year later, I think, I did my first drop into the bowl. Applause. <laughs> yeah. And I, I actually still do this, so I'm, and I'm alive, so it's, it's good fun. Uh, but to me, this has sort of been a, a really good experience to actually feel what it feels like when people smirk, laugh, shake their head at you. Uh, and I still keep doing these things. Because the thing is, this suddenly happens, and you have less time to do, do these things. So to me, it's really important to sort of come across and say, don't put off things you don't know how to do. Because suddenly this happens one day, and your old life will seem like a holiday. This is, of course, great fun, but it takes time. Time you never have. And the other thing is, we're at the point where we're running out of time. So what do you do when you're running out of time? I think that's maybe one of those times when it's even more important to do a detour, to come up with new ideas and methods to solve some of these huge problems. We have the climate, we have refugees, we have technology. These are hurdles that all of us know about, but we feel that we've come so short. And we have politicians, industry leaders, who's just saying the same and doing the same year after year. So what do we do? Well, for me, one solution is coming up with small projects like weapons of mass enjoyment, where I try to do my little part by turning conventions on their head and make people think again. This is a growing installation where uh, it now consists of a sunflower gun uh, it has a disguised stencil art bag. It's got the slingshot that shoots egg containing paint. And lastly, it has the um, laugh box, which aim is to spread contagious laughter in public. The thing is, I've, with these graphs, I'll put, I'll put this lab coat on today just to sort of give some credibility to my um, <laughs> scientific theories. Uh, but I really think that we, um, or I think this is, uh, like, I, I hope most of you will agree with me, but I think we, we're all born with a lot of guts. But we haven't got much experience when we're born. But as time goes, we grow older and get more knowledgeable. The problem is that our youthful craziness starts to disappear. And I think that's a real problem. So... Um, for me, since I've made this graph, I've, I've sort of decided that the sweet spot is uh, when you're 47. That's where guts and experience collide. So you can guess how old I am. <laughs> Next year, it will be 48. But, uh, but to me, these are really important uh, issues to sort of have in the back of your head. Because I think one of the things that happens when you grow older, you c become an adult, one of the things you downsize is play. You'll play with your kids, of course, and you'll also agree to play when there's workshops at, at work and so on, uh, but never alone. And I think, like these pioneers here, they just imagine what ridicule they must have endured. 
when attempting their ideas. And you know, for most of these guys, none of their inventions got any further than this. A laugh, there were, there's like two guys we remember from the flying pioneer history, and that's the Wright brothers. But these guys and their attempts, that was necessary to move this whole movement forward. And there's n never only one person coming up with a great invention. It's the sum of all these different people trying out different things. What I'm really happy about today is that I, I think the solution is quite close. And, and when I say close, I, I think it's really near because I think it's exactly sitting in the audience here. It's new, the, the new young people. And uh, Greta has been mentioned a lot of times uh, these days, but I think it's, it's remarkable to think that just a few months ago, that's when she started her uh, strike for a better climate. And she's, she's had enough talk. And at the same time, her knowledge is still filling up. But what she lacks in um, uh, experience, well, she's got tons of guts. And I really think that we need more Gretas. She can't pull this by herself, even though she's actually rallying a whole global movement. But we need more Gretas. And I think one of the things, being a teacher myself, it's, it's, it's about time we change our school system to be more experimental and explorative. Speaking of education, uh, does any of you have this problem where you share um, an apartment, house with flatmates, friends, children, spouses that somehow are unable to change the an empty toilet paper roll? <laughs> well, I do. And um, I'll introduce you to uh, the Toilet Paper Roll Academy. So with my many years of educational experience, uh, I've um, developed this uh, very simple uh, three-step um, exercise for students to be able to identify a role as empty. <laughs> and not only that, because the problem is, in my house at least, that role stays there, and then the new one sits next to it. So the challenge is to get them to put the new roll, which looks like this, <laughs> onto the hanger. OK. Uh, I like to clean my ears. Or I love to clean my ears, is more right. And, and please stay with me. Yeah, probably see where this is going. But I've calculated that process to be around 19 seconds. And as I calculate a little bit more, it actually adds up to a one week of cleaning ears during a lifetime. Kind of sad. What if I could slash that in half? Well, introducing speedy ear. <laughs> so um, the first version, which you see up here, had some trouble with uh, the speed, and it got caught in my hair. <laughs> so uh, there was a second version with a speed dial and uh, a much nicer casing. So this was the Speed Ear 2000. <laughs> the marketing material is almost ready. And uh, I've actually contacted the Johnson & Johnson for some um, collaboration opportunities, because the refill opportunities are endless. And, uh, of course, there's uh, some um, sort of products that come with this as well. So this is one of them. I'll, I've got a couple of samples here, so I'll, I'll just throw them out. <laughs> it's the tooth and air pick, the hygiene travel kits. <laughs> so as you can see, or, well, I've introduced you to Shindugu, and as you can see, I'm, I'm a big fan of Shindugu. 
It's inspired me in many of my projects. And to me, these projects have, uh, for me, become wood for the projects. The two Norwegian words, why and because, put together. A and one of the reasons for that is, a lot of the time, people ask me, wh why do you do this? <laughs> why? My wife even asks me. <laughs> and kids. kids. But I can only answer a proud because. Because these pro uh, projects, they're all about the process. The end result is, of course, fun in many ways, but making them, they are just so much fun to do. And they bring up opportunities for laughter, conversation, and so on. A year ago, I was lucky enough to initiate a workshop at the Oslo Architecture School of Design and Architecture. And um, this, this workshop was going to be a workshop where we were building tall bikes. In the run-up to the workshop, I had a meeting with the students, and I had to admit that I'd never done this before, and uh, neither have any had any of the students. But one response to this, which made me really happy, was, how hard can it be? It's true, no students were injured. We only had our cheekbones really sore because of smiling. <laughs> but uh, I really, really love bicycles. They're a fantastic innovation. They're simple, but yet with so many possibilities. So last year I finished my Sinambulante, a portable cinema on my bike, combining bicycles and eight millimeter movie. And it's so much fun projecting these on random walls around where I live, and uh, the feedback is a huge reward. Also with bikes, uh, I have an alter ego, Dr. Pedal. He runs the cyclist Revolutionary Fraction. You don't want to mess with him. <laughs> so, summing this up, I just want to share how some of these ideas are sort of materializing in these projects from my head and what I do is I sketch, I draw and I doodle these things down to make them real. And that's the first sort of lag where I need to see if whatever my brain has cooked up is actually going to work. And um, sort of to make this sketching process even easier for me, I've uh, developed the um, the sketchbook shoulder holster <laughs> and I'll do, uh, I'll do a quick demonstration because imagine if you're walking around and you get this world changing idea <laughs> boom <laughs> you can have it down on paper in no time <laughs> so these sketchbooks They've been building up, uh, and uh, I have tons of them. But to me, they're a fantastic testament to all these crazy ideas. Some has actually been made, and some remains in those sketchbooks. And that's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, but what I want to sort of leave you with tonight is a challenge, and that is that you all try to find your own detour and path to gold. 
So when you walk home afterwards, please make a detour. Thank you and get lost.